This sermon is titled My Mind Part 7 Maintaining a Positive Mindset Be enriched as you listen All right so we've reached the end point <laughs> the last message in this series on our mind on the mind and uh, today which is the seventh message part 7 in the series on my mind we are going to talk about developing and maintaining a positive mindset developing and maintaining a positive mindset just bring all of this together and so really what our goal is as we learn to apply uh, biblical principles and practices with our mind it is to come to this place where we have a positive mindset all the time no matter what situation we're going through no matter what challenges we will look at things with a positive mindset so that's the place where we want to be you see god is interested in our thinking god is interested in how do you think the way you think where you and i think like psalm 139 verses 1 and 2 the psalmist says god you know you know everything about me you know when i sit down you know when i rise up and you know my thoughts from a distance to god you know wherever heaven is god is looking right into our mind and he's very aware of our thoughts you know my thoughts so god knows your thoughts and why would god even pay attention to your thoughts and mine why would he even be interested why would he you know because he cares about the way we think it's important to him it matters to him how we think he's taught us in his word how to think and now he's looking right in seeing how we think he knows our thoughts from a distance so let's talk a little bit about the importance of how we think proverbs 23 it says you know as a man thinks in his heart so is he i i know there's a context to that but i'm focusing on this part of the verse which says as a man thinks so is he you are what you think what you think what we think it affects our behavior it affects how we live so how we think is so important where the mind goes the man follows right so how we think is so important it affects how you know how we journey through life are you going to be happy no matter what happens or are you going to let circumstances and situations dictate the level of your experience so that all happens in the minds as a man thinks so is he you know and uh, it's a well established fact that if you know we have a positive mindset uh, it affects our of course our, our psychological and physiological well-being you're having a positive mindset and so that's very important to have that positive mindset think about the apostle paul you know some of us may make 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 the assumption that the great apostle paul He was called to be an apostle. He, you know, wrote so much of the New Testament. He did so much for the kingdom of God. God would surely have made life very easy for him. But that's not the truth. On the other hand, Paul faced all kinds of situations. And he writes about this in Philippians 3 uh, and and uh, verse 12. He says, "You know, I know how to have plenty. I know how to be in lack. I know how to abound. I know how to you know to be in necessity and so he's talking about the fact that he's been he, he been through life in conflicting circumstances and situations it's not always been easy it's not always been good there have been challenges but philippians 4 and verse 13 that verse that we know philippians 4 verse 13 paul says i can do all things through christ who strengthens me that means You know in all of these situations I've been through all of it but in all of this my approach or my attitude my positioning is I can do all things Amen so he had this I can mindset I can when there's a, when I'm you know I'm feeling really blessed when everything is going good I can when things are rough when things are tough I can I like how the New American Standard Bible puts that latter part of that verse. He says, "I can conquer everything. Every difficulty. I can conquer every difficulty through Christ who infuses strength in me." 
Amen? So that's the place where we want to be. Yes, life will have all of its challenges. But in all of that, we have this I can mentality. God is going to help me conquer. I'm going to come out the winner. God always will cause me to triumph in Christ. That's a positive mindset. Are you all with me so far? So how do we develop such a positive mindset? How do we maintain that positive mindset through whatever we go, in, go through in life? I want to share with us very quickly six biblical practices. Six biblical practices that you and I can you know, follow in our lives and then it, it just becomes a normal thing for you and me that this is how we are going to look at things, look at circumstances and maintain a positive mindset. Are you ready? Number one, develop a Bible-based self-image or develop a self-image that is based upon the Bible. Self-image is what you think about yourself. It's what, how you perceive yourself. What do you think about yourself? How do you perceive yourself? Now, very interesting. There are different metaphors or pictures of the Word of God. And one of them in James chapter 1 is that it is a mirror. So when you and I look into the mirror, you see your own image. The real picture of you in the mirror. And the Bible is telling us that God's Word is like a mirror. So if you really want to know what you should look like, look into the mirror of the Word of God. And have an image of yourself based on what you see in the Word of God. Are you listening? So we can put it like this. Develop a portrait of yourself based on your identity in Christ. See, the Bible says, if any one of us are in Christ, we are a new creation. A new creation. So if you're a new creation, it means you have a new identity. And you and I need to understand that identity. And then let that become our self-portrait. That this is who you see yourself to be. This is who I am. My identity in Christ. And we often say this, who I am in Christ is who I really am. Let's say that together. Who I am in Christ. Uh, let's say it like you really believe it, right? Who I am in Christ is who I really am. Let's say it again. Who I am in Christ is who I really am. You know, this thing helped me so much as a teenager. And, you know, all of us, you know, we've been through that stage and some of us, you know, maybe going through that stage as teenagers. But, you know, we, at that time, it's formative. You know, our, our, we are forming our own self-image. Who am I really? And, uh, you know, over time, we arrive at some uh, image or, uh, of ourselves, a portrait of ourselves. And so during that time, you know, many, many times for us, te for teenagers, it's, it's influenced, that image is influenced by what people say, what parents say, what teachers say, what marks they score in their subjects, how good are they in sports and so on. You know, that person, he scores more than me. He's better than me. You know, he runs faster than me. He scores more goals than me. He hits more runs than me. He's a teacher's favorite. And so based on that, this self-image is being developed. But as a teenager, when I discovered who I am in Christ, I chose to form my self-portrait based on that. This is who I am in Christ. That what God says about me, that's it. So there are about 140 verses in the New Testament that talk to you and me about who we are in Christ. The Bible says you are blessed. The Bible says you are the righteousness of God. The Bible says that you are accepted in the beloved. The Bible says that you are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. The Bible says that you are justified. You have peace with God in Christ. And on and on and on. So many things the Bible says. This is who you are. Are you with me? I said, okay, that's who I really am. Embrace that. Now, Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, latter part of that verse says this. You know, we must acknowledge every good thing which is in us in Christ. Acknowledge. Recognize as a fact. Affirm as a truth. Acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ. Because you are in Christ, there are good things in you. 
Acknowledge it, affirm it, recognize as a, it as a fact. Say it, this is who I am, because I am in Christ. And so you create a portrait, an image of yourself. This is who I am. So somebody, somebody comes and says, oh, you're poor little nothing. So, no, I'm not poor little nothing. I'm highly blessed. Inside me, I have an attitude of blessedness. I'm blessed all the time. I got an attitude. <laughs> My attitude is I am blessed. Because the Bible says you're blessed in Christ. Are you with me? So that's your image. So when people demean you, they may speak ill of you. They may, you know, you may face a situation that looks like you're defeated, but inside you have the attitude of a winner. Why? Because my God always causes me to triumph. Always causes me. Means in this situation, He causes me. It may look bad, the situation may be bad, but my image is God always causes me to triumph. No questions about it. Are you with me? Now we have a book, APC book. It's called Who We Are in Christ. It has all of these 140 some scriptures. I'd encourage you to take it or download it, read it through. It's broken down there for you. Just let it settle in your heart and paint your portrait based on the scripture, the mirror of God's word. This is who I am in Christ. So number one, have a Bible-based self-image. Now, you know, in the Bible, we see uh, several examples uh, of, of this importance. So think with me. You know, as God brought his people out of Egypt and he was taking them into the land of promise, he told them, I'm going to help you conquer nations greater and mightier than you. So I'm going to help you do that. You're going to conquer nations bigger than you. So he brings them to the east side or the east bank of the river Jordan. They are in that place, or Mount Paran that's called. And all they had to do was cross over the river Jordan, then they will be in the land of promise, the land that God said, it's for you. And so he tells them, you know, send out 12 spies, let them go survey the land, come back with information so that you can then plan your entrance into the land. So these 12 spies go in and God reaffirms, this land is for you. I'm here to get, get you the land. This is your land. Go survey it and come back and then possess it. So these 12 spies, they survey the land, they come back, and you know, 10 of them say this, yes, the land is exactly the way God said it. It's flowing with milk and honey, it's wonderful, but there's one problem. There are giants in the land, and we are like grasshoppers. So what was their image? I just call it a grasshopper image. They had a grasshopper image. They saw themselves like grasshoppers in front of those giants. But then there were two others. They had a different image, Joshua and Caleb. They said, let us go right now. Let's go possess it because they, the giants, are bread for us. Roti. <laughs> we, can, we can chew them down, you know. Hey, they're like bread for us, literally. They had a different image. They had an image of, man, let's go get it. Let's feast because God is with us. See, two people saw the same situation. They saw the same giants. But the image in them determined the moment these ten spies saw themselves as grasshoppers, battle was over. Finished. You're gone. Because you have a grasshopper image. Warriors with a grasshopper image. Battle is lost even before they start to fight. But then the other two, they saw them as bread. Let's go. Get it. They won the battle even before they started to fight. So that's the importance. See, God has spoken his word over you. He has spoken his promises over you. But what is the image you have in yourself? Have an image. Your, your self-image must be Bible-based. Base it on what God said, on who God said you are in Christ. Amen? Number two. The second practice is this. Practice renewed thinking. Practice renewed thinking. Now we've talked about renewed thinking a couple of Sundays ago. That means we learn to think the way God thinks. See, if you and I want to walk with God, we have to reorient ourselves to start thinking the way He thinks. God is not going to change His way and come down to our level. 
He invites us to rise up to his level of thinking, his ways and his thoughts. And you've, you and I are going to walk with God. You've got to learn to think God's ways. A good way to illustrate this is in Matthew 14, you know, Jesus has been speaking to this great crowd, 5,000 men, um, other women and children. So we don't know what the total number is, but at least five, you know, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people have been listening to Jesus. And then Jesus turns around to his 12 disciples. He says, you know, I've done my job. Now you give them something to eat. Excuse me, none of them are as we peed, you know. Lord, what are you telling? We've got to give them something to do. Now imagine if you were one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. That could have happened. If you, if you were born at that time, you could have been one of the 12. And Jesus turns around to you. There's 5,000 people in front, and he says, please give them something to eat. Now he's not teasing. He's not joking. It's a serious instruction. Please give them, you give them something to eat. Now, this is what the Gospels record. One of the disciples, just like any one of us, says, Lord, which bakery should we go to? Where would we get bread for so many people? Another disciple, become graduate, he says, Lord, where can we get enough money? He's calculating. He's done his calculation. We don't have enough money. Even if you find a bakery that can supply the bread, where's the money? But Jesus asked them, what do you have? What do you have? And Philip comes and says, we have five loaves, two fish. Okay. You know what Jesus tells next? He says, I want you to go get them all seated in groups of 50. Now again, imagine yourself being one of those 12 disciples. You're going out in the crowd and you're organizing everybody. Groups of 50, please. Groups of 50. What's happening? Dinner is coming. And in your mind, you're thinking, there's only five loaves and two fish. But you're, you're busy. Groups of 50. Sit down, sit down, sit down. And you're busy organizing. And in your mind, it's like, does Jesus know there are 5,000 people? You know, that's what's going on in the minds. But he says, okay. Then you come back. The 12 come back to Jesus. Lord, we've got them organized. Now what? Okay, let's pray. And he prays. And he puts a small piece of the bread, small piece of the fish in your hand. He does that to all the other 11. And you're looking at Jesus with a piece of bread and a fish, and saying, Lord, this is not enough for me. And he says, go feed. Imagine yourself. You're walking to this first group of 50 people. They're all looking at you in anticipation, and you know you've got a small piece of bread and a small piece of fish in your hands, and you're walking to them. But the moment you reach the first person, and you give that bread and the fish, suddenly something happens. There's another piece of bread and fish. Maybe it's even becoming larger. <laughs> I don't know. But a miracle begins to flow through your hands. And you keep giving and giving. And like everybody's excited. You can imagine Peter jumping up and down. Hallelujah. You know, fish and bread. You know, just passing it on. What's the point? If you and I want to walk with God, we've got to think like God. We've got to think in terms of miracles. We've got to think in terms of possibilities. We've got to think in terms of what God can do, not what my capacity or our capacity is. Are you listening? That's renewed thinking. I'm not saying don't use the natural mind. Use it. But if you want to see the work of God, you've always got to think at His level. Think His ways and His thoughts. And He invites us. Don't think that God is going to tell you to do only things that match your capacity. He never does that. He says, you give them something to eat. That's how he talks. And we've got to learn to think in terms of God's ways. Are you with me? Yes or no? So think renewed thinking in every situation. Think what can God can do. Ephesians 3 verse 20, the Bible says, you know, that God is able to do above all, 
above all that we can ask or think or imagine according to his power that's at work in us. God is able to do more, so we need to think more, think big. Uh, as God speaks, you think aligned to the way he speaks into your heart. So think renewed thinking. What eyes haven't seen, what ears haven't heard, what hasn't entered in the heart of man, such things God has prepared for those who love him. Number three, how can we train ourselves to think positive? Number three, picture Pray and proclaim the promises of God fulfilled. Picture, that is visualize, envision, picture. Pray and proclaim God's promises fulfilled. See it fulfilled. See, the way God speaks, God is a God who declares the end from the beginning. He declares the final outcome at the beginning. So when God spoke to Abraham, you know, he could have said, Abraham, I am going to make you the father of a big nation. But he never spoke that way. He said, Abraham, I have made you the father of many nations. I have made you. He has already come, he's speaking as though the work is already done. I have made you. And Paul emphasizes that in Romans chapter 4, verse 17. He says, you know, God spoke like this. I have made you. He spoke the end from the beginning. Now, 15 years have gone. Abraham has been walking with God and no son in sight. No child. And so, like any of us, Abraham is wondering, and he's questioning God. And read about this in Genesis 15. He said, God, what about this child you spoke about? Where is that child? So, one night, God calls Abraham. He says, Abraham, come out of your tent. Look up in the sky. And in that clear Middle Eastern night sky, you could see these stars. And God says, Abraham... I want you to count the stars. Count. So Abraham starts counting. One, two, three. And he goes on and on and on. And what's happening? A picture of these innumerable stars is now captured in his mind. And God says, that's how many your descendants will be. So from that day, Abraham, in his mind, he has a picture of the promise of God fulfilled. Every time he has to think about, you know, what is God going to do in my life? This is it. Night, starry sky, so many stars. That's how many descendants I'm going to have. And later on, God spoke another picture. He said, and as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So imagine sand on the seashore. Another visual, another picture of the fulfillment of God's promise in his life. And so every time Abram would, would think about his life, he had this picture of the promise of God fulfilled. He had a picture of the end, the, the promise of God being a reality. This night sky, the sand on the seashore, that's my future. Are you listening? So you and I, need to picture the promise of God fulfilled. What would your life look like today if the promises of God for your life are fulfilled? Can you see it? Can you picture it? Paint a picture in your mind intentionally. God, these are the promises in the Bible that I am believing. These are the things you have spoken to me by your spirit. You're leading me to do. And so this is the picture of myself in that fulfillment of all the promises of God. I see myself there. Can you do it? Yes or no? Picture the promise of God fulfilled. You know, if your marriage is struggling, picture a happy marriage. The reason God gave you a marriage is not for you to endure through life. No, marriage was designed by God to be a blessing. So picture a home where you and your spouse are enjoying each other. A happy home. Picture a home where your children are thriving, you're flourishing. They're flourishing. Picture that in your mind. 
Because that's the promise of God fulfilled. Picture yourself being a success, you know, whatever your profession is, that you're doing really well, you're, you're successful, because God said, whatever you do will prosper. Picture that happening in your life. What would that picture look like? Can you do it? It's not a sin. God told Abraham, look at the stars, the sand on the seashore. That's my promise for you fulfilled. Picture that. Amen? So, picture the promise of God. Then when you pray, you pray from that place. You're saying, Father, I thank you. My family is blessed. Father, I thank you. My children are mighty on the earth. Father, I thank you. There is joy and rejoicing in my home. Now, at that moment, maybe it's not there, but you are like God. You are praying from the end towards wherever you are because God declares the end from the beginning. You're co-working with God. Are you with me? See, what did God do to Abraham? After he told him to change his image, Later on in Genesis 17, God comes to Abraham and says, there's one more thing we need to fix. We need to fix how you're speaking. Stop calling yourself Abraham. Call yourself Abraham. Stop calling your wife Sarai. Call her Sarah. Abraham, father of a multitude. Sarah, mother of many princes. That means you start proclaiming the fulfillment of the promise. God was very intentional in that name change. Are you with me? So you proclaim, you picture, you pray, and you proclaim the promises of God fulfilled in your life. You declare the end from the beginning or anywhere in the middle of the journey. You know, like I said earlier, you know, at this moment, there may not be the voice of rejoicing in your home. Your home may not seem very blessed. Your family may be in, in really big difficulty, but you begin to say the promise of God. You have a picture in your mind of your home, your family, your marriage, your children being blessed. You begin to pray from that vantage point. You begin to pray and say, God, I thank you. My home is blessed. My family is blessed. My children are blessed. Uh, I am blessed in what am I doing, whatever I'm doing. I thank you that the promises of God are fulfilled. You're praying from that place and you're proclaiming that over your life. So you got a picture. Pray and proclaim the promise of God fulfilled. See it from that place. Are you with me? And Abraham is a great example. The Bible says in Romans 4, we have to follow the faith of Abraham. Follow his example. Follow his faith. So that way, what happens? You are maintaining a positive mindset. You're not letting the circumstance dictate how you think. You're letting what you picture, pray, and uh, proclaim the promise of God. That is your mindset. Number four, how do we maintain uh, a positive mindset? Be strong mentally. Be strong mentally. Don't quit. You see, life is not going to be easy. There are going to be challenges. Now, you might, you know, if you've been working for one of those big IT companies, maybe you received a letter from Amazon or Facebook or Twitter or whoever saying, hey, sorry, no job for you. I don't know. I'm just, whatever. But that is not going to scare you. So you're strong mentally. Sometimes we get tired about fighting. What did the Bible say? I'm, I'm looking at Hebrews 12, 1 to 4. The writer of Hebrews says, you know, don't become discouraged. This was for, but don't become discouraged when you're striving against sin. But look at Jesus, looking unto Jesus. So when you're tired of fighting, and sometimes the battle seems long, hard, intense, extended, when you're tired of fighting, look at Jesus. Look at how he endured the cross. And look at what God did. He elevated him. He raised him up to a place higher than every other name. So look at Jesus. Draw your inspiration. If Jesus went through it, I'm going to go through it, and God will bring me through. So even if you're fighting, stay the course. Sometimes we get discouraged because the journey is so long. Like the people of Israel, they got discouraged, the Bible says, as they were journeying to the promised land. And the reason they got discouraged was they were always looking back instead of looking ahead. 
They were looking back to Egypt. Hello, God is taking you to Canaan. So you've got to be thinking about Canaan, not about Egypt. And that's one reason why many of us get discouraged in the journey. You're looking back. Stop doing that. Look ahead. Look at where God is taking you. Your destination and your present situation is no indication of your final destination. Your final destination is the promise of God. So look ahead. That will inspire you. And sometimes we get discouraged because of the calamities we face. And David, you know, when he faced calamities, the Bible says he strengthened himself in God. So you and I need to know how to go to the presence of God, strengthen ourselves. We sang today, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So stay strong mentally. By looking at Jesus, looking at your destination, and just renewing yourself in the presence of God. Stay strong mentally. Number five. Get ready to close here soon. Number five. Keep hope alive at all times. Hope is an expectation of something positive. Hope is being optimistic at all times. Keep hope alive. Now why is hope so important? Because the Bible says that hope is the anchor of the soul. Now when a ship is in stormy seas, they drop anchor, it goes down to the ocean bed and then steadies the ship. Hope acts like an anchor for our soul. And Hebrews says, Hebrews 6, 19 says, our hope reaches behind the veil that it, to, to the presence. It connects us to God. So when you and I have hope, that means you have a positive expectation. It steadies you and me. And how can we have hope? It's based, again, on the promise of God. The Bible says, Romans 4, verse 20, about Abraham, it says, against all hope, he still believed in hope according to what God had spoken. So he had hope because of what God had spoken. Now, here's the thing. We must keep hope alive at all times. All times. Keep hope alive. Now we know Psalm 23. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. Everybody, put your hand in front of you. Say, my cup overflows. Now, you and I got to think like this all the time. My cup overflows. So say this with me. I think my cup overflows when my cup is overflowing. I think my cup overflows when it's half full. I think my cup overflows when I don't have a cup. And I think my cup overflows when I'm not sitting at the table. What's the point? You got to think the same thing all the time. You think, my cup overflows. So where's your cup? Don't worry about it. My cup overflows. Why? Because his word says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup. Where's your cup? Don't worry. My cup overflows. Soon the table will come, the spread will come, the cup will come, and the overflow will come. Because God is faithful to His Word. Are you listening? But you and I must think all the time. Keep hope alive all the time. You have an expectation, my cup will overflow. I don't have a cup, it's okay. Here I have His Word. I think all the time my cup overflows. I'm not at the table. That's okay. I have his word. The table will come. The spread will come. The cup will come. The overflow will come. I'm not worried about it. I have his word. So that's the way you keep hope alive all the time based on his promise. Last, number six. How do we have a positive mindset Number six, stay single-minded. Worship team, please come. Stay single-minded. To be single-minded means I am fully persuaded, I'm fully convinced, I am settled as far as this matter is concerned. No second thoughts about it. No second guessing. 
fully persuaded. And on the psalmist said, Psalm 119, he says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your word. I, mean, I don't want to be double-minded. I love your word. James tells us that a double-minded man is unstable, unsteady in all of his ways. If you're unsteady, you're not going to accomplish anything. Because you're indecisive, you're unable to take action. But when you're single-minded, nothing can shake you. Single-minded. You and I need to be single-minded about who God is. God is a good God. Full stop. Not like sometimes He's good, sometimes He's in a bad mood, sometimes we don't know. No, God's a good God. Truly, God is good. God is a God of love. He loves all the time. Or oh, today God's angry with me. God's upset with me. No, God's a good God. He loves all the time. He is Jehovah Rapha all the time. Morning, afternoon, night, midnight. He is Jehovah Rapha. Single-minded about that. No double-mindedness about that. God is Jehovah Jireh all the time. Single-minded about who God is. Sometimes we get so confused when we listen to people. So God, He makes, He's the one who's, He's Jehovah Rapha, but He also makes you sick. I mean, make up your mind, please. If He's Jehovah Rapha, He's not split personality. He's Jehovah Rapha all the time. He's going to be the healer all the time. So single-minded about who God is. Single-minded about who you are in Christ. No questions. Nothing's going to change that. Single-minded about the way you're going to live. I'm going to live holy. I'm going to get, live righteous. I'm going to walk before God you know, in, in honor and righteousness and truth and integrity. Single-minded on those things. Nothing can shake you. Amen? When you're single-minded, no matter what the circumstances is, you're steady. You're steady. You can be positive, not up and down. I know God come, will come through. The battle may be hard, it may be long, but God will come through. So let's quickly review. How do you and I maintain, develop and maintain a positive mindset? Number one, have a Bible-based self. Paint a nice picture of yourself based on the Word of God and the promise of God. This is who God said. That's who I am. Second, practice renewed thinking. Think in terms of miracles. Think in terms of possibilities. Think in terms of what God can do in that situation. Three, picture, pray, and proclaim the promise of God fulfilled. It is done. So you're at the end, even as you're making the journey. You're settled there in a place of peace. Number four, what was number four? Be strong mentally. Be mentally strong. Encourage yourself looking at Jesus. Look at the destination. Encourage yourself in God. Be strong. Number five, keep hope alive at all times. Be hopeful. Be expectant of something good. And you can do that because of God's promise. And number six, be single-minded about who God is, His Word to you, who you are in Him, how you're going to live. No second-guessing. That's not open for negotiation. I'm single-minded about it. Amen? And you and I can live with a positive mindset. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. As we stand here this morning, I want to invite you to do something. Maybe you've done this before. Maybe you've never done it. You see, faith and hope are twins. Or you want to say, it, faith and hope are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other because the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you don't have hope, you can't have faith. You have to have hope. That is, things hope for a desired outcome, an expectation. And then you have faith that pulls it in. 
from a realm of expectation to a realm of experience. You've got to have faith and hope. So as you stand here, I want you to use your God-given imagination and see what life would look like for you from where you are today. What would life look like if the promise of God was fulfilled for you? What would life? It doesn't cost us anything. Just imagine. In your mind's eye, what would you look like? What would life for you look like if the promises of God in the Bible and what He's spoken to you are fulfilled? Just imagine that. Say, God, I am going there today. I'm going to the end. And I'm going to look back from there. I'm going to look at life from there. I'm going to pray from there. I'm going to proclaim from there. This is where I want to be because your promise is true. You know, visualize or imagine your home, your family, your children, your career, your business, your professional life, who you are in this world. Imagine you being what God said you would be. That's what God told Abraham. Abraham, look at the stars. The sand on the seashore. See it. And speak that. Proclaim that. Pray that. Let's do it. Father, we, we see your word fulfilled in our lives. We see ourselves healed and whole and well and blessed and victorious and prosperous and successful and overcoming and, and just blessing others, Lord. We see ourselves in this way. We are, see our lives being bless, a blessing to other people. We see our lives touching others touching our city, our nation, and the nations, Lord. We see your promise fulfilled for our home, our family, and our children. Because you have spoken already. You have said, I have made you blessed. I have made you victorious. I have made you an overcomer. I have made you a conqueror. I have made you a victor. You have said that. You have spoken it. And so we see it, Lord. We see ourselves being successful. We see ourselves being a blessing. We see ourselves doing great exploits. We see ourselves advancing the kingdom of God. We see this, God. We picture it. And Father, we pray. We thank you that your every word you've spoken will be fulfilled in our lives. We thank you, God, and we proclaim that over our lives. Thank you, Father. Standing on the promises of God, my. 
of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the spirit sword, for we are standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong call. I'm overcoming. We are overcomers. Promises of God. So we sing and we declare we're standing, standing, we're standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, we are standing on. Father, we just pray over each one here, God. As we stand upon your word, stand upon what you have spoken concerning us and choose to make your word the basis of our self-image and of what we expect, of our expectation, of our hope and of our faith. Father, we thank you that not one word of your precious promises would ever fail. Not one word will return to you empty. But your word will be fulfilled in each of our lives, Father God. For each of us, your word will be fulfilled. As we, through faith and hope, believe, believe your word, receive your words. Thank you, Lord God. Not one of your good promises would ever fail. Not one. We thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, oh God. We honor you. Praise you. Thank you. Keep that picture in your mind. When you pray, have that picture in your mind of every promise of God for your life fulfilled. See it. Pray from that place. Proclaim from that place. Keep that picture in your mind. God's word. God's word fulfilled in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, may every heart be encouraged today. Every life be encouraged today. Thank you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to pray. We're going to close. I'm just going to speak the benediction. But if you need prayer, I, just, I call up our pastors, our life group leaders to come and be here in front. 
make yourselves available to pray for people, to minister to people. So if you need personal prayer, feel free to come to any one of our pastors and life group leaders. We'll be right here in front to pray with you, to minister to you one-on-one. -on -one. I will be here to do that after we dismiss. Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet presence and precious presence of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcw.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.